So now we're moving into the early Roman Empire. And yes, we kind of overlapped a little bit with Pompeii, but bear with me. We're dealing with art that has changed as we move into an empire because this is a whole different form of government. So in 44 BCE, Julius Caesar is is assassinated. You know, the whole etu brute, etc., etc. There's a Roman civil war that happens. We have the first triumvirate, or sorry, the second triumvirate that appears. And out of that comes Caesar Augustus. But he starts life as Octavian. He is the adopted son of Julius Caesar, and he's only 23 years old. He will eventually defeat Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And in 27 BCE, the Senate bestows upon him the title of Augustus. Effectively first emperor, but actually meant first amongst the people. I won't get into that too much. From the outside, looking in at this government, you would have thought that the Republic was continuing because he would make a show of going to the Senate. He would make a show of continuing to elect councils and involving the tribunes. But behind the scenes, everything goes through Augustus. And he's the first emperor. He's generally considered the first emperor and one of the good emperors, although corruption will quickly move in when it comes to the empire. So, as an emperor, this changes things. Instead of a whole group of people in charge of the empire, where if I wanted to take power in Rome, I'd have to off all the senators, all the tribunes, I'd have to off the councils, etc., Now, all that power rests with a single person, which means all I have to do is off one person. So now it's no longer about wisdom. Now it's about strength. And we see that here. Here's that head of the old man that we talked about earlier. And here's a portrait of Augustus. And you see Augustus suddenly looks a lot more like that sculpture of Pompey, which I said was not very popular at the time. Suddenly the body is idealized. Now don't get me wrong, he's not a god. He he will be deified after death, but he's not a god at this point. What he's doing is he's showing strength, because it makes it less likely that his enemies will come after him if they feel that he's quite strong. So these images of the emperor were put all over the empire. Fairly shortly after this, within a few generations, every temple, every city, every marketplace in the Roman Empire would have a statue of the current emperor. And there were all sorts of extra statues because, of course, every time an emperor dies, you have to get a new one. And we see the emperor in various guises, various clothes. We see him dressed as a warrior, or as a priest, or as a magistrate, or a general. And these are all roles that he has. And he's trying to get those ideas across. So if you see Augustus in a temple, he's going to be dressed as a priest. If you see him in front of a civic building, he's probably going to be dressed as a magistrate or judge. You kind of get the idea. And this sort of role-playing was not uncommon with the masses. He would try and fit into whatever role he was fulfilling at the time based on clothing. Just like George W. Bush uh, flew to the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln to give a speech about the Iraq War. And when he did, he went in a full flight suit, even though he, of course, isn't a naval aviator. So we get the same sort of idea. His pose and appearance are very interesting. So much of his pose is based on the spear bearer, but with a couple of Roman differences. First of all, we have this gesture. This is the gesture of oration. So he's public, he's speaking publicly. And this is a sign of great respect. This is a skill that the Romans felt was particularly important. We see that we have the tensed arm and tensed leg, the relaxed leg and relaxed arm, just like we've seen 
from the Greeks. And we have the proportions of the Greeks going back to the spear bear and polycolitis. Down here, we have this odd little winged child. And it's not to say that there were odd little winged children following around uh, Caesar Augustus, but rather what we're seeing is Cupid. Cupid is the son of Venus or Aphrodite. And the family of Augustus, known as the Julio-Claudian family, felt that they were direct descendants from Venus. So it brings in some possibly deistic lineage without saying that I am a god. Uh, the child is sitting on a dolphin, referring to the birth of Venus from sea foam. You'll notice that he's barefoot. Being barefoot was supposed to be a sign of a living god on earth. Now, Caesar Augustus would not have specifically approved that. That would have been the sculptor's decision. He would have been very cautious to not see himself as a god or depict himself that way. And this brings us to the armor, the kuros that he's wearing. And we get a better detail of it here. And by the way, the whole thing will have been painted probably something similar to this. And the kuros shows a military victory, specifically the, Parth the Parthenians, sorry, Parthian return of captured Roman standards during the first triumvirate. So when Julius Caesar comes to power, the wealthiest man in Rome is a man by the name of Julius Crassus, who decides that he doesn't have any military victories, whereas his other two rulers or people that he's ruling with, Caesar and Pompey do, so he goes out to defeat the Parthians. Unfortunately, he gets defeated by the Parthians when they literally use arrows to pin him and his entire army to the floor of the desert somewhere in Persia. And then some ru rumors state that he was forced to drink molten gold. Uh, some come up with other interesting ways that he died, but... Either way, he died, and the Roman standard served like a flag for their military units were captured by the Parthians. Augustus gets those back, not through force, but rather through diplomacy. So that is being seen here, showing his power in cleaning up one of the messes of the end of the Republic.